Hello and welcome to the International News Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Dunicic. Subscribe to our channel to stay in the loop on all the global affairs that are occurring today. And there's a lot of them. But let's get right into our main story today, which concerns the COP26 or the UN Climate Summit 2021, which is right now occurring in Glasgow, Scotland. And it's going to be occurring for the next two weeks. So we're probably going to be covering this story a lot. In fact, we covered it about two days ago or two business days ago, last Friday, right before the summit began. And our story then focused on some of the pre-promises or pre-proposals and goals that were stated by the attending nations on what exactly to do about global warming and climate change. Now, on Friday, we stated that the goal of this conference was to ensure that the international community, the United Nations, and the more than 130 countries present at this summit could figure out a way to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. Now, pre-industrial times before the Industrial Revolution, since then, world temperatures have rise by 1.1 degrees Celsius. So we're almost there at that 1.5 mark. And on Friday, we reported how the major proposal was to reduce all emissions globally by at least 45% by 2030. Now, the promises made now are actually significantly less, though it's only been a few days, so a lot more initiatives are going to be taken care of and taken into concern. We just want to cover right now the three main promises that have been made so far. Number one is concerning deforestation. Number two is concerning methane gas emissions. And number three is concerning a specific nation, South Africa, and its coal energy dependent uh, economy and how that's going to be solved. So let's go over the promises, what they mean, and the likelihood of them actually being addressed and uh, followed through on. So the number one promise made and the biggest one, according to Britain, and this actually is the most significant promise and pledge made by all the member states attending so far, has been to end or reverse deforestation by 2030. Now, according to the UK, who is the host country and is the main nation responsible for this summit, they have had countries which contain 85% of the world's forests pledge to end or reverse deforestation by 2030. Now, it's important. Deforestation is crucial and critical to mitigating and reducing climate change. (laughs) Forests and trees actually absorb carbon emissions and they reduce greenhouse gases, making global warming significantly less likely to happen. This is actually kind of, think of it as our sponge against all of the emissions that are created by coal plants or other uh, greenhouse gases. They absorb these bad gases that increase global temperatures. That's what forests do. That's how I would explain that to a child, okay? Now, the reality is, is will this promise actually be followed through on? A very similar promise was made during the Paris Climate Accords, but deforestation has actually increased in a significant number of countries. The problem doesn't still exist. It has increased over the past six years after promises were made to stop it. Now, will things be different this time? We're going to see. Some of the major nations that have signed to this deal are the United States, China, Brazil, Congo, Colombia, and Russia, countries that contain some of the world's largest forests. Brazil, more specifically, who has the Plantania and who has the Amazon, has some of the world's most major forest resources. And that actually makes things a little bit more questionable. Deforestation does not occur because people want to destroy trees. Deforestation occurs because wood is a very stable commodity with an extremely good price. It is beneficial to a nation's economy, it's beneficial to private businessmen, it's beneficial to investors, and it's beneficial to blue collar workers who work jobs in deforestation. Wood also provides uh, materials for building houses, creating paper. My table is made out of wood. Now, if we didn't have a wood industry, I don't know, you would actually be seeing my boxer shorts right now. I don't wear a full suit when I do these emissions. (laughs) But the reality is, Brazil is a sign is a signatory and one of the nations pledging to end deforestation. 
But its president, Jair Bolsonaro, is a man who has actually been a proponent of not just deforestation, but developing the Amazon and creating more economic zones where industries can be built in the Amazon rainforest. And that's another reason that deforestation occurs. It's not just because we need wood. Deforestation is also occurring today because there is a major increase in demand for agricultural land and pastoral land. What's the difference? Pastoral land is for animals. Agricultural land is for uh, fruits and vegetables. A new fact that you just learned from me. Now, Brazil, it's, it's in its inherent interest to keep this deforestation going, but they have pledged that they are actually going to end or reverse deforestation by 2030. And the reason that I mention this now, I'm gonna go more into detail about broken promises at the end of this episode. But a lot of nations are making a lot of promises and that's to greenwash their image. Now, in recent years, developing countries who have been polluting or deforesting or doing things that are just generally bad for our environment have been making attempts, very strong attempts. And I'm looking at you, China, I'm looking at you, Brazil, and I'm looking at you, India, have been making strong attempts to create a green image and say, we're so green, we're helping the environment, look at all these initiatives we're doing, look at all these promises we've made. But in reality, they're doing nothing. And Brazil is actually the biggest uh, violator of this. And they're the biggest uh, perpetrator of greenwashing and maybe even the country that invented it. Now, Brazil, a nation that is an upper middle economy. It's not a poor country, but it's still a developing yet wealthy country is extremely dependent on international investment on foreign direct investment. Now, Brazil recently, because of massive deforestation and wildfires that occurred in the Amazon faced international outrage and many global companies that invest in Brazil threatened to divest and leave the country, leave their businesses, take it out from the nation's economy. And obviously it is in Brazil's interest to present this green face and to keep investments coming in. It's not just Brazil doing this. A lot of developing nations are doing this and they're using this summit. They're using the COP26 to make themselves seem green, but they have no intention on following through on these promises. Now, let's go forward on the second major pledge made which has been primarily by the United States and the EU, with Joe Biden being the main pusher for this initiative. Now, despite falling asleep in the middle of the summit, Joe Biden has actually been the major motor of the second largest proposal that has been made so far during the summit. And that has been to globally, with the EU and other nations, decrease global methane gas emissions, which is a major contributor to greenhouse gases and global warming, by 30% by 2030. Now, Joe Biden's proposal actually focuses on the most realistic. This is actually a realistic proposal that has not been politicized or made to seem like it's something much more than it is. Joe Biden's proposal is to focus on methane flaring and gas leaks. Now, methane flaring and gas leaks are actually very common on gas pipelines, natural gas pipelines, where there's small little holes and leaks and methane gas is just coming out. Methane flaring is coming from these methane sources and it's just going out into the atmosphere. That is actually, while expensive, very easy to solve and actually doesn't work against anyone's interests, doesn't destroy any jobs, in fact, creates a lot of jobs and helps a lot of companies from losing a lot of money from natural gas that, it's, that is leaking out, right? So that is realistic. Now, other initiatives such as uh, addressing methane gas production in agriculture are significantly more difficult to address. Specifically, cow burping and farting. That is actually a major, it sounds funny, it sounds like a, it was a joke when we were in school, but this is a fact. Cows burping and farting produce a significant portion of methane gas emissions, and that contributes to global warming. But what are you gonna do, Joe? You can't go around and kill all the cows. So obviously, maybe 30% by 2030 is not going to be achieved, but this proposal is actually more realistic. And I finally wanted to segue this, our last segment, with the most realistic and easiest proposal to actually be carried out on. 
During this summit, the United States, Britain, France, and Germany have made a commitment to work with South Africa and provide the nation with $8.5 billion in funding over the next five years and specialist knowledge on how to uh, trans transition from its coal-dependent energy market. Now, understand South Africa as a country, its energy receives its energy, 90% of its energy is produced from coal power plants, 90%, okay? One that creates some of the most polluted cities in the world, some of the lowest air quality in the world. Two, it's really bad for the environment. South Africa is a major country with a large population. Just doing this will decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions. But more importantly, it's going to show the rest of the world, a lot of developing countries. Now, if you're from the United States, unless you're from a small town or you're from maybe somewhere in the Midwest, it's highly unlikely that you're from a city that's powered by coal energy. If you're from Europe, it's even less likely, okay? Unless you're from Central Europe. For example, it's very common in Serbia uh, for major cities like its capital, Belgrade or Beograd, to be powered by coal uh, plants, which is a very old form of power and probably the most polluting. But in developing countries, this is extremely common. And if the problem can be solved, and if the energy transition can be made in South Africa, it can show the rest of the developing world they can do the same as well. But it's not that easy, okay? I do actually believe this proposal will be followed through on. I do believe the eight and a half billion dollars will be fully financed and will be provided to South Africa and the knowledge will be provided to South Africa. But I don't believe it's going to transition from coal to more renewable energy sources within five years. It's not just about stopping the burning of coal. It's not just about building wind farms and building solar panels. It's about changing, and I mentioned this in our last episode regarding the COP26 and climate change. It is about changing entire infrastructures of major cities and the entire country. That is going to take some time. It might not even be realized by 2030. And that's the final point that I want to talk about on this episode. A lot of great promises have been made during this summit, but the reality is a lot of these promises aren't going to be followed through on. Greta Thunberg, who is right now today probably the world's most well-known environmentalist and who I personally like to make a lot of fun of, uh, Today, during a protest, went out and said, the only thing that's happening in the summit is blah, blah, blah. Nothing concrete is happening. They're just talking and these are just promises. I actually agree with Greta on this one, 100%. She's completely correct. And as UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres said, it's extremely easy to sign a declaration. Every country in the world can come together and sign a declaration and say, we want to end this problem. Saudi Arabia is a signator of the UN Convention on Human Rights. Let that sink in for a second. You can sign a convention. That doesn't mean you have to actually follow through on it. The UN and international law is not that strict, okay? And you have to understand that that's just the nature of international relations. Anyone can sign a paper. It takes Xi Jinping five seconds to put his signature on a paper. Boris Johnson, five seconds, his signature's on a paper. Macron, five seconds, his signature's on a paper. Joe Biden, fi 15 seconds. Let's give him 10 seconds to wake up. His signature is on a piece of paper. But all of these world leaders, especially those that come from democratic countries, now have to go back home and present to their national legislatures, their voters, their constituents, these proposals. And in many cases, what needs to be understood here, and I said this earlier, deforestation, coal production, any form of carbon gas production is not done because people want to destroy the environment. People don't cut down trees because they hate trees and they just, you know, want to destroy trees. People don't produce coal because they want to destroy the environment. They do these things because they are economically beneficial. They help a nation's economy develop. They provide jobs for people that need jobs. 
The other option is unemployment for many communities. The other option is to slow down for developing nations, their economic development and their economic growth. So in many of these countries who are making promises, developing and non-developing, the U.S. included, it might not be in their interest to follow through on these promises. Joe Biden has been kind of the biggest pusher at this conference for massive global change and major changes in legislation to fight climate change. But the reality is, back home in the United States, even his own Democratic Party is not in full agreement with him. Joe Munchen, who is a major Democratic senator from a coal-producing state, isn't even fully on board with Joe Biden's newest climate proposal. That may or may not get passed. And Joe's future uh, legislatures that he's going to push, his future laws that he's going to try and push through Congress, through the House of Representatives and the Senate, are going to be dependent on votes from congressmen and senators from different states. And this reality also exists for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It exists for Macron. It exists for any leader of a democratic nation. Shit, even dictatorships can't be fully consistent, okay? Now, that's the reality. And the climate uh, environmentalists and, and the alarmists, they are correct. World leaders are not doing enough to end climate change. But here's the reality. Scientists have said that even if every proposal that has been made so far at the COP26 is followed through on, even if every single proposal 100% is followed through on, and there's no way every proposal is going to be followed through on, maybe, maybe 40%, and that's an extremely ambitious number, are actually going to be realized. Even if 100% are realized, global temperatures by 2100, by the year 2100, are still going to rise by 2.7 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial since the pre-industrial age. And the goal has been to limit it to 1.5. Now keep in mind, when global temperatures rise by two degrees Celsius, average global temperatures, island nations like the Marshall Islands will be wiped out. Rising water levels are going to occur. Extreme weather events are going to become more and more common. And that's the entire problem with the approach environmentalists, activists, and even world leaders today have with climate change. The approach shouldn't be mitigation because mitigation cannot be had. You cannot completely change national and regional economies. Ending certain forms of, forest, of deforestation, carbon production could fundamentally disrupt the world economy. It could cost at the very least a lot of jobs. And environmentalists are at best not aware of this fact or at worst, admittedly and intentionally not acknowledging it, that this mitigation probably is not possible. It just fundamentally isn't. We are taking the path of most resistance. Not a single major proposal has been made for climate adaptation, which is an approach to climate change that states, instead of focusing on mitigating what's occurring in the environment, we should accept that it's gonna happen. And that's the reality. It's gonna fucking happen. It's gonna get hotter. We're going to have more extreme weather events. A lot of the ice that we have is going to melt, if not all of it. Island nations are going to be wiped out and sea levels are going to rise. That's just a fact. Instead, we should be investing and saying, let's prepare for this. Let's invest money to see how we can combat rising water levels. Maybe we can decrease them. Maybe we can artificially bring down water levels. Maybe we can one day artificially bring down global temperatures. And at the very least, what is possible and what exists today is technology to either rebuild island nations or find a way to address the refugee crisis that will occur when these island nations are wiped out by rising water levels. More money should be invested in adaptation. More attention should be brought to adaptation. Less money, less efforts, and less bullshit promises that are never going to be realized have to stop being made towards mitigation. That's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but take this as a prediction. In 50 years, the environment and the climate will change. The question is, will we adapt to it? Let me know your opinion in the comments. Let's have a constructive conversation on this. Subscribe to our channel once more. Like or dislike this video. I want to see what you think. See you next time.